Hello class, welcome to week eight, our final week of Practical Ministry 200 Discipleship in the Local Church. This week, our theme is Shepherding, Discipleship, Tongues, Prophecy, and Love. You'll notice that your assignments this week are different. The discussion group and the paper are the only elements. There is no uh, journal entry for this week. I have made a video of regarding uh, the final paper so that it give you some insight from me to you. Go back and watch that. I'll post it here in the lecture, but it's also in the discussion group as well. Let me say it's been a pleasure to teach this uh, to you and with you. Uh, we all grow in these processes, and I don't believe that there is any way in eight weeks to give you a perfect model or answer every question. But again, this is to open your hearts, your minds, and the conversation that you're having with your leaders or you're having with your pastor to discuss how we can implement better discipleship and what that looks like, again, in a very practical way. Um, you'll probably uh, get a review of um, this class so that you can make that assessment. Uh, we both at uh, Spirit Life Seminary, as well as myself, appreciate that. Uh, it gives us ways to make things better. As well, personally, I would love to hear your feedback, uh, not for the accolades, but rather how I could improve uh, in the future. I enjoy um, teaching these practical elements and anything with you, but I am uh, growing also as a, an instructor, and so I appreciate your your uh, criticism, uh, positive and negative, so that I can become better. So let's go ahead and dive into week eight, our final week together. Uh, of course, you have um, your assignments that are listed in the reading, your final chapters um, in both books. And as we've done the last several weeks, uh, looking at the very practical nature from discovering discipleship of Blevins and Maddox, you have three chapters. Uh, the final chapters is a legal chapter. I'll let it stand for certain by itself with you. Um, and we have in the Church of God of Prophecy in our movement, we have several resources to help you in that. Um, if you're in North America specifically, I encourage you to, um, if you're a pastor, get with your state or regional overseers, uh, as well as international offices to get um, some of the safeguards that have been put in place, such um, as uh, setting yourself up as a nonprofit in the United States. Uh, again, for those of you here in the States, that is very important because it has some legal safeguards. So I'll, I'll let those elements stand for themselves, um, but there are some practical natures there. The chapter 20 deals with family, um, and while there is a great discussion there, I'm going to focus more in the heart uh, of 21, but from a very personal uh, side of this with you. As the chapter 21 is entitled, Administering Faithful Discipleship, this gets into the questions um, to, in so many words, of how do you uh, do this now? How do you implement uh, a discipleship program, discipleship ministries in your church? And so I want to uh, give you some thoughts, um, while I will not dare say mine are perfect, but hopefully, again, it will stimulate some thoughts. We um, have been looking deeply at discipleship and what it is, how you develop it at different ages, the cognitive abilities, the, the emotional makeup, uh, the different models, the different behaviors, all, all of these things about undergirding what discipleship is and the environment um, both, again, in, in general and specific environment, but the general tone or uh, the environment of discipleship in your church or your ministry that you're involved in. But when you begin to look at implementing it, um, you have to keep something in mind, um, in my opinion, uh, is who is it you're discipling? This is where context and culture comes into very much of play not just in maybe your neighborhood versus the neighborhood five miles down the road, but whom is it that you're drawing in? And, and to help illustrate this, I'm going to give you a couple of pictures here on screen that you can look at. Fairly recently, um, someone posted a picture, a dear friend of mine, a, a ministry leader that I have great respect for, posted a picture similar to this that um, I saw a lot of comments on. And, and I'm, I agree with the heart of this, and here, here it is for you. Um, this says modern day discipleship, attend, connect, serve, go, and then these drippings of water upon the world. Then the, to the right of that graphic or that picture, it says Jesus' discipleship strategy. He poured into three to 12 to 70 to 500, and then there's a flood of water that hits 
the earth. And as you focus in on that, that looks like an end goal that me makes a lot of sense. And so it definitely was Jesus poured a lot into his closest three. No one would argue that. Um, and if you have three people coming to you saying, pastor, leader, teach me, pour into me, you absolutely do this. This is the personal relationship. This is personal discipleship. And if your life, I was talking just recently to a young, uh, wonderful man of God, and he shared in his personal life, there were two or three people that he was discipling. This is absolutely your personal discipleship model. That's why Jesus took it in this context. Um, but my question to you is, if you are looking for personal discipleship, then you definitely need to hone into this. You need to grab hold of the heart of this. But if you're a pastor or a ministry leader, we really don't look at it so much in that context. In fact, I could uh, flip the, si the, the side of this over and actually show you this. Now, excuse my lack of great graphics here, but I took it and just overlaid and, and retitled it Jesus's Ministry Strategy because it's absolutely fact of scripture that Jesus did not just minister to the three and they went, but rather Jesus compelled. In fact, scripture says, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come. Jesus went out into the city. He was out doing ministry in the streets. He was out at the synagogue um, and the temple doing ministry, speaking, teaching, and preaching to large uh, groups of people. In fact, Think about the 5,000 men that Jesus um, uh, preached to and in the great miracle of him multiplying the five loaves and two fish, right? This was absolutely a group of people that he had touched out in the city. His ministry, granted uh, fame of it, had spread, and so people were coming to watch. But there was this movement in the city of these people that wanted to know more about Jesus and as he, as I spoke of him speaking to the 5,000 men in that uh, miracle, there became a crowd that came to hear him. And he preached the Sermon on the Mount and others in these great crowded in avenues. And he preached. But as we follow that through, those were not the ones that stayed with him in the end. There were then followers. There were those, in fact, um, we, I used the 12 disciples and the three, but there were other disciples that were phrased with that. And so my point is this, Jesus ministered to everyone, his ministry, the disciples, and the uh, we would say the modern ministry of Jesus impacted greatly his entire city. The entire city of Jerusalem heard about him, and there were the crowds that came to follow him. And so in all of that, Jesus had a great group, but in that process of teaching and preaching, his ministry did focus in on those closest to following. And so I just want to throw that in your thought. And here in, in this graphic, you see how this broad range of the crowd moved into the followers, to the disciples, to the three. And then, yes, that second part of the graphic, why can't we flip it uh, as maybe a way I would like to say this instead of do we have the left side of that graphic or do we have the right side? I, I want to propose to you that we have both. I believe Jesus did both. Now, this is not just simply a discipleship ministry strategy. I would say this is in, in a church leader's context as a pastor, this is your ministry context of a vision of strategy. And so you, I believe we can have both. I believe, in fact, a good strategy takes into account both because there are different elements. If you simply individually are having people come to you uh, and you have two or three people come and you begin to think, no, I need to start with lots of people. No, you're missing the heart of it. Uh, in fact, as we look at this entire ministry strategy, all of this is not discipleship. Uh, it isn't at that point. In fact, I would tell you that the eye of the needle, the difficult moment, the crux of discipleship is at the narrowest spot in the funnel, the, the neck of that. And I think that it's true in discipleship. I think as we look to the ministry of the church and we look to the goal of discipleship to produce 
Christ followers that are disciples, uh, strong and mature in every how of the way you want to say that, fulfilling their purpose in the kingdom of God, there comes a point that they have to go through this difficult moment of discipleship. And they may begin in a broad range as the top of this funnel is, but as they work their way through it, as they grow, as they nurture, there is a narrowing of that both numerically in your church, but also in their own journey. And so there, there is that, that caveat that uh, occurs. But if they will go through it, and we see Jesus's ministry started out with a lot of people, but in the end, as it narrowed down, there was only a handful. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, there was yet still a crowd in that upper room that were praying and seeking the Lord. And that day God expanded because remember Peter preached the message, not to just a few, but to lots. He spread the gospel, but that didn't make them all disciples, right? He started back. So we see that Peter is an example of one of those three. He preached a message, thousands received, and yet it expanded. And so what happens? That funnel almost circulates. It almost becomes circular in that point. And so I want you, as you write your papers, I want you, as you begin to think about the strategy for your ministry, and as you specifically focus in on discipleship, you're not going to uh, spend your time in this funnel process. I don't want you to do that. But you must see the big picture, the old line. You must uh, not just see the trees, but you must see the forest. You can't get blinded looking at the tree and miss the whole forest. You need to back up for just a minute, and you need to see the totality of ministry, top to bottom. And then inside of that, then look, where is discipleship taking place in our ministry? How do we get people into discipleship and what happens to them after or through that process of discipleship? And so um, give that some thought, if you will. Now, something I'll give you is you look to um, flipping both of these paradigms together. You see the church ministry attend, connect, serve, go, and then that expansion. I'll, I'll tell you briefly. Uh, our church ministry in, in my heart has been in a very similar context. And so I, I'll show you this graphic here to give you some visual, visualization of it. Uh, I believe that we need to have a wide net to reach as many people to share the gospel as we can. We do that in events and activities and in personal outreach, all of those things because we want to draw them in in that widest neck of the funnel, that crowd. Rick Warren kind of perfected some of this terminology and purpose-driven church. It's a great book. Uh, further uh, taken into simple churches, you see some very practical natures, but the, the widest part of that neck is to go out and to compel them. And as we do, we talk about wanting to connect with them in relationship. Uh, I have used in another ministry the word no, K-N-O-W, to have friendship, relationships with others, and to introduce them in relationship to Christ. This is a two-way relationship with the church family and ultimately with Christ. And as they enter into that, we invite them deeper in that funnel, that process to grow. This is a piece of our discipleship. There's the things we do to disciple. There's the uh, programs, the classes, the the, uh, we call it our growth journey. We invite them in. And so it takes a very wide neck. And at the end, it begins to funnel. And at the end of that uh, piece of that growth journey is the placing them in a place of ministry to serve. Because why this is the place where a true disciple, the eye of the needle becomes real. If they begin to grow, then they begin to serve. What happens? The funnel happens yet again. And they're going through because in the end, we believe as they serve, they'll make an impact. They'll make a difference in their community. As they make a difference in their community, it widens even greater. That impact will become an impact into our region and ultimately our world. And as we continue to see that, that world, we draw them back into the church to help connect them, to grow, to serve, etc. And so, so this is kind of when I look at my church's ministry strategy vision. This is a visual of it. Now, what you're going to do in your paper uh, and for maybe others that may be watching another time, as we think about discipleship, now we're zoning in to look at the piece of discipleship. What is it I'm going to do? We understand how we're getting what people we're drawing in and where we're going out. 
one last time the the beginning graphic of this the jesus dis discipleship strategy nothing wrong with that this is what i would classify more of a personal discipleship strategy you, you're not going to disciple individually as a as a believer 20 50 or 100 I, jesus did not personally disciple that many people simultaneously his closest were the three he he had the 12 that were next closest and a larger etc and then he sent them out two by two initially and then ultimately in the great commission to serve and after the resurrection uh, 50 days later, the uh, day of Pentecost, the church is birthed, and all of these elements we see growth begin to happen because of the personal discipleship Jesus did. But when we look at the church, we look at the total ministry of how we do evangelism, how we share the gospel, where we draw them to connect or or to become members or engaged in our church family and where discipleship happens and where they're ministry. And so all of these things are happening, not just discipleship in the context of a church family. And so just simply all of these graphics, all of this conversation, I want you to step back for just a moment uh, before you get too deep in discipleship and look and say, okay, this is the total picture of our church family. This is what God has called us to do. We have clarity in all of these areas. Now, if you're missing clarity in a piece of that, uh, you may need to also answer that to fully answer your discipleship. Because if your discipleship element is removed over here, to, to one side and the rest of your ministry exists or flows uh, on another paradigm, then it, it's not going to flow well. You're not going to have a lot of people connecting to it, your discipleship and your discipleship's not going to produce people back in your ministry. You're actually competing with one another through your discipleship and the rest of your ministry. But your discipleship needs to be, again, as these funnels kind of help give us some visual, they, there needs to be a process where all of your ministries are working seamlessly together. And I believe that we see that in the life of Jesus. We see that definitely in the early church. Uh, the the um, apostles were sharing the gospel. They were coming together from house to house to continue in the breaking of bread and in the teaching. We see the broad range that is happening, the broad net of ministry, but we also see the smaller discipleship numerics, the smaller I mean, so that they could multiply and go out further. And so West, I think scripture is very clear in, in all of that. So where does discipleship fit into your ministry? Not just so much in the funnel, but what is it that's feeding it? Because it'll help tell you, in my opinion, what it is you can do and where it naturally, discipleship naturally fits into the flow of your ministry. And so the goal of discipleship, so much that we've covered and some of the tools of discipleship we've talked about. Now you're kind of figuring out where does it fit in the flow of your ministry and how does this functionally look? And that's that's kind of, in my version, a lot of what 21 kind of is, is thinking, how do you organize it? Uh, talking events and programs, needs and objectives, some highlights of that. How does it function? Um, um, what what you should do inside of that, all, all of those things, the different approaches and, and even the organizational uh, side of that. And so I hope that has maybe give you some new thought uh, or a, a way to step back again, uh, as you write your paper, you're you're not really going to spend any time in in those key areas. I mean, literally, if anything, a couple sentences just to mention how it fits in your whole ministry. But you need to, as a leader, as a pastor, as someone in your church, you need to see it all before you can address the small. If you address simply discipleship without giving some context in your own heart and mind. Then, then it won't flow well. So if you have questions, please reach out to me. I'd be glad to answer them. I love this conversation. Uh, discipleship in the local church is vitally important. Uh, having a strategy for ministry, what it is God's called you to do, um, not just in one area, but across and how they work together. Our ministries and greater, we should say our vision should be one vision and everything should work together to accomplish that one vision. Multiple visions is actually division, not unit, uh, united vision. And so you're seeking a unity of your vision that flows together and discipleship fits into that. I, I would strongly say discipleship must be a part of your vision um, and, and you have to address where that fits. So again, 
God bless you. If I can help you in any way, please let me know. I look forward to what God is going to do in your life and see how you and the Lord expand even what we've done here. God bless you.